Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story, we welcome back Hobo Sam 21, author of Hell's Ranch and a Cabin in the Snow. And as ever, please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. And title. Marco Polo Part 3 Let's get straight into that. An icy breeze slipped between the dark ominous tree trunks. A small patch of dirty blonde hair belly poking above the frozen snow rippled in the breeze. I made my way through the snow, attempting to catch up with the others. The sun had slipped behind the hills, and with its absence came a biting cold. Without doubt, the need to find Mark was growing more urgent. I hear a voices ahead, I quicken my pace. It's his quad! I heard Matt call out. Rushing to close the distance, I came up on Matt, Yellowknife, and Bruce. And sure enough, buried in the snow, sat Mark's old grizzly 660. And using a flashlight, Yellowknife studied the surrounding woods. This way, he called, pushing through the snow-covered branches. We searched a dark forest. A sharp metallic clang cut through the night air. Son of a bitch! Bruce yelled. I turned to see him hopping on one leg and rubbing his other leg. There's a damn bear trap down there, and everyone froze in place. Seriously? I asked. Bruce reached into the snow and pulled up a massive steel trap that was half closed. Yeah, seriously. Luckily, it was mostly frozen. Bruce yelped as the trap suddenly snapped and the rest of the way shut. He threw it down in disgust. Yellowknife pulled up another. He slammed it against a tree trunk, setting it off. Don't step on him. It hurts, croaked out a muffled voice. Mac! Mac cried out as he began digging in a pile of snow. He desperately poured the icy white fluff away and covered his brother. Mark whimpered when Matt embraced him. Careful, bro. I'm all jacked up. And with tears in his eyes, Mac cleared the remaining snow revealing Mark's mangled leg. The frozen mess of blood and torn flesh was still held tight by the trap. Matt threw his coat over Mark's shivering form. Each of us slowly made our way towards them, careful to place each foot on solid ground. Bruce was calling someone on his radio. I need a chopper out here ASAP. We found the boy, but he needs medical attention right now. And Bruce read off our coordinates. A fuzzy voice came through the radio. I'm getting denied a flight plan for that area. No inbound flights after sunset. When I fuck him, Bruce called back. I'll deal with any blowback. And there was a brief pause, and then the voice returned. Copy that. I'm an hour out. Do we have a clear landing? Negative, Bruce replied. We're either dropping a basket or moving him. Well, Roger, see you soon. And while Bruce was on the radio, Yellowknife reached the brothers. That is not good. That is not good at all. He said anxiously, studying Mark's wound. Together, him and Matt cleared the area. Yellowknife held the trap while Matt gingerly lowered Mark onto his back. Matt held him tightly while Yellowknife fumbled for his lighter with numb fingers. Producing a small zippo, he handed it to Matt, and then he hurried to the nearby tree and began shaving off bark. By the time I reached them, he had gathered a fair amount of fuzzy tinder. And catching on to his intentions, I snapped off multiple low-hanging pine bows. Stripping off the smaller needle-laden branches, I added them to Yellowknife's now smoldering tinder pile. and We were able to add the main branches next, and before long, we had a decent blaze going. The fire released a desirable amount of heat, but what Mark really needed was a hospital. Matt held Mark's hand tightly. Hang in there, little brother. I'm going to get you out of here. It broke my heart seeing him like this. They had suffered enough in their short lives. All of our coats were stacked into a makeshift bed for Mark. He slid in and out of consciousness. When awake, he would squirm about trying to escape the pain of his thorough appendages. Bruce and I were able to remove the trap. 
and yellow knife wrapped the cut off sleeve of his hoodie around the wound. And through the darkness, a figure emerged. It was Charles. I shot an apprehensive look in Matt's direction, unsure if he would lash out towards Charles. His attention was fully on his brother, warming his fingers and monitoring his leg wound. Bruce gathered more firewood. We built it large enough to warm the entire group, as well as work as a beacon for the chopper. I noticed that Yellowknife was avoiding his grandfather, no doubt still feeling betrayed by his revelation. I straightened up and listened carefully. In the distance, I could make out the familiar womp 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 of a helicopter. I hear it! I shouted, standing up. Right then, Bruce's radio came to life. All right, Sheriff. I got a visual on your little camp out. What's the plan? Bruce looked up through the tree branches as the rescue chopper's light steadily approached. I think we got room for a basket. Hear the spotlight so I can see what we're working with. The woods were suddenly lit up brighter than a summer day. And Bruce looked to be correct. The overhead coverage was pretty sparse. A thick black rope hit the ground with a thump near us, followed by a black figure sliding down it. The man approached the firelight, and I didn't recognize him from town. He stood well over six foot tall, and had a black beanie cover on his head, and was wearing black-on-black -black fatigues and a combat vest. How are we doing this fine evening? He asked with a devil, made care grin. Bruce shook his hand before asking, ah, Where are you from, son? I don't believe I've seen you around before. I just visiting the area. When the car came in, sounded like you could use someone with fast roping experience. So, here I am. Now let's see about getting this kid fixed up. Well, that was a good enough answer for us. Bruce radioed to the pilot to drop the basket. And upon its arrival, four of us gently lifted Mark into it. Using the provided blankets and straps, we secured him snugly. Matthew gave his hand a squeeze. Hang on just a little longer, bro. We'll get you home. And in no time at all, they whisked him up and loaded him into the chopper. And soon, it was zooming across the sky towards the nearest hospital. The stranger well, stayed behind. Apparently climbing back up the rope was frowned upon. And besides, when it came to speed, every pound counted. I couldn't help but notice he carried some sort of MP5 looking gun, half under his jacket. Something I'm assuming most search and rescue members don't do. Using snow, we were careful to fully extinguish the fire. And while we did this, the stranger kept staring off into the dark woods. With the fire now no more than a sizzling puddle, we started our return journey. I tried to update Laura and Susan, but I had no service. Remember to tread carefully. We don't know how many more traps there might be. Yellowknife warned. Using our previous footprints, we reached the quad rather quickly, and from there, it was easy to backtrack to the vehicles. Yellowknife started the first snowmobile we came to. He tipped it on his side and spun it around. Now facing towards Susan's house, he rode it up and over the fallen tree. Matt climbed into the second sled and chose to climb the steep embankments above us, going around the tree instead of over. Now we just had to get this jeep out. Uh, hey Matt, why don't you try and get it out? I asked. After all, it was his, so if anyone should tear it up, it should be him. Matt fumbled his way over the fallen tree that was blocking his way out. He hopped in the driver's seat and fired it up. I stepped back, both unsure of what his plan was, and also positive he would go all out. And sure enough, he threw the transmission in reverse and pegged the throttle. The jeep lurched backwards. The rear bumper gorged a large chunk of bark off a tree trunk as it slid up. The rear tires climbed up and over. Well, it was going good until he came down the other side. He high-centred and his back dug into the earth and his front sticking into the air. Okay, hook up one of the sleds and pull me down, Matt called out. He had a knife manoeuvred into place. He pulled a strap from the back of the jeep, hooking it to the snowmobile, and he got a small running start. The strap stretched and then pulled the jeep free. The stranger nodded in approval. Not bad, he said. The group picked their way through the fallen tree and gathered around the jeep. Bruce spoke up. Matt, I want you to take the snowmobile back to your mom's and let her know what's going on. And Matt nodded. He jumped onto the free snowmobile and sped off through the night. I'll take the other one back, 
volunteered Yellow Knife. Sounds good to me, said Bruce. I think we all knew Yellow Knife didn't want to ride in the jeep with Charles. Claiming the driver's seat, I turned the rig around. Bruce and Charles got into the back bench while the stranger rode passenger side. I tried starting a conversation. How long have you been in Elk City? I asked. He shrugged. A short while. We continued a bit farther in silence. How long do you plan on staying? I asked. While looking out of the window, he answered. Until my job is done. Uh, what might that be? He looked over at me. A bit nosy, ain't you? He asked. I decided to let it go. We bumped along the snowy path until we reached the barns and then the house. Both snowmobiles were parked next to the front porch. I pulled up next to them and put the jeep in park. Me and the stranger climbed out, letting Bruce and Charles exit. The front door swung open and Laura ran out. She hugged me and I held her tight. I'm glad you made it back. Releasing her, I replied. I told you, I'd be fine. I tucked a stray hair behind her ear and we entered the house. Charles decided to remain outside. He sat on the porch swing and lit up his pipe. And judging by the smell, I figured it wasn't tobacco. Once inside, we were greeted by a feeling of despair. And Mark isn't responsive. His leg is in a bad way. We're rushing him into surgery to amputate it right now. Bruce informed us. I felt a dark pit growing in my stomach. Matt brought his mum a coat. Well, we're heading that way right now, but because of this stupid virus running around, only immediate family can visit him, said Matt. Well, I'll take care of things around here. If you need anything brought to you, just let me know. I told Susan. Thanks, God. That means a lot. Matt rushed her out the door, and I heard the roar of his inline six as they sped towards town. Bruce pulled out his phone. I better let search and rescue know we found him. Laura, do you need a ride back to town? And she nodded. You got things under control? She asked me, and I gave her a thumbs up. Yep, feed the little guys and milk the fat ones. And that brought a smile to her face. <sighs> My rugged farmer man. She gave me a kiss goodbye and then followed Bruce out the door. Or oh, if you need a hand, just give me a call, offered Yellowknife. Eh, will do, I told him. They all piled into Bruce's F-150. He turned around and headed down the driveway. As the tail lights disappeared into the snow-filled darkness, a thought occurred to me. Where did the man in black go? I glanced around the yard. It appeared empty. And looking to the barn, I saw a fresh set of tracks heading that way. Pissed that this random dude was sneaking around, I followed after. I made it to the door of the barn before I remembered he was heavily armed. Letting some common sense seep in, I decided to use the side door, and to do so quietly. Even as I walked slowly, careful to place each foot down gently, the light crunch of the frozen snow sounded way too loud. And after what felt like an eternity, I reached the door. Cracking it open, I peeked inside. The goats were bleating loudly, both hungry and in need of milking. Inside was pitch black except for a small beam of light shining around. No doubt the stranger was in there. But why? He was talking in an earpiece, but I couldn't hear what he was saying over the noisy goats. I opened the door a little more to get a better look. I shivered as a breeze blew across my neck. The man froze. Realizing why, I jerked away from the crack, just as his flashlight illuminated the opening. I heard footsteps pounding in my direction. I hid behind the door. The man took two steps outside the barn, gun in hand. He used his flashlight to scan the dark snowy landscape. The instant he looked to the opposite direction, I sprang into action. Swinging my leg with all of my might, I caught him in the shin. And both his legs shot out from under him, and he hit the ground hard flat on his stomach. His gun landed a few feet away in the snowdrift. The man rolled onto his side and looked up at me. Well, that was a bit uncalled for, he said. I drew my three fifty seven auto, careful to not directly aim at him, but also not aiming away. What are you up to? I demanded to know, and he gave me a shit-eating grin. I was calling for a ride. I thought everyone else had left. 
Why were you out in a barn? I asked. He pushed himself up into a sitting position. Well, it's pretty cold out. I wasn't going to let myself into someone's home. And besides, the animals sounded hungry, so I figured I'd fold him some hay while I waited. Well, I had to admit, he had some pretty good reasons. I knew he was up to something, and judging by the stupid smirk he had on his face, he knew that I knew, and didn't care. Get up, I told him. We're going to give Bruce a call and figure out what's going on. The man shrugged his shoulders nonchalantly. No problem, bud. He got halfway up and then hit me in the face with a fistful of snow. The icy cold momentarily blinded me. A hand with a grip as strong as steel grabbed my wrist, holding a gun away from himself. The man threw a punch into my gut, knocking the wind out of me. Gasping, I dropped to one knee. The stranger then expertly twisted my pistol free from my grasp, and he threw it into the woods, and then kicked me square in the chest. I hit the ground hard. I briefly saw stars as my head bounced off the frozen ground. Sorry, bud. No hard feelings, and just a bit tight on time. The stranger walked towards the woods, picking up his own gun on the way. And by the time I had regained my breath and my head stopped spinning, he was long gone. <sighs> Good riddance. I thought to myself, hoping to never see him again. I decided against calling Bruce. He had enough on his plate already. Besides, the man was gone. Where to, I didn't know or care. The rest of my evening was spent caring for the animals and nursing Bruce ribs. And rather than return home, I crashed on the couch for the night. I woke early the next morning to a text from Matt. Mark made it through the surgery. He's still unconscious, but there was no evidence of brain damage. Well, that was a relief. Mark was a tough kid, but the human body could only take so much abuse. I did a quick sweep of the property, but the only footprints in the snow were my own. Satisfied, I headed for the barn. All the animals were accounted for. I fed them, and then spent an hour wrestling with a weird pulsating milking machine. And Mark could show me how it worked when they first got it. He was so excited not to have to milk by hand, twice a day, any longer. But that was a long, long time. Ago. After just two hours, everything was settled at the Stump family farm. Remote sat in my POS loaner car, I sat in the house while it warmed up. I tried not to think about it, but the identity of the stranger had me curious. Where had he gone after Spider kicking me into the snow? Why was he here to start with? Rather than wasting time pondering things I had no answers to, I went outside and sat in the blazer. I slipped, spun and cursed my way out of the driveway and onto the road. The main road was ploughed enough to make good progress, but I knew the dirt road leading to my place, where it wouldn't be. I knew that it would be bad, but I wasn't exactly expecting a four-foot-tall berm of frozen snow to be blocking it. I approached the turn off slowly, and there were tire marks going down the road. Not only was my cabin the only house on the road, but I owned it and had clearly marked it as private property. You wouldn't believe how many tourists assume every dirt road in Utah is public land, even when posted otherwise. No, living in a van doesn't mean you get to set up camp anywhere you like. Instagram be damned. And while I was annoyed someone was trespassing, I was also relieved they'd broken a trail, because now I would be able to drive home. And turning off the highway, I carefully picked my way down the trail. It wasn't quick, but I made it without getting stuck. The tire tracks continued past my cabin and up the embankment behind it. I'm curious, I got out of my car and followed on foot. Patting my hip, I felt a familiar bulge in my oversized automatic. I hadn't done me much good last night, but I wouldn't fall for the pocket sand, or snow in this case, trick again. I walked up the hill. I hadn't got far when I saw a blacked-out Dodge crew cab buried in the snow. And as I drew near, I saw all four tires were flat. I jumped as a voice yelled from behind me. Ah, you don't give up, do you? And I turned to see the stranger from last night walking in my direction. Now, I was mad. This punk was not only on my property, but he had the audacity to yell at me for being here. And so I shouted right back at him. Listen, asshole, this is my property. You better get lost. And he threw his hands in the air. That's what I've been trying to do all morning. 
we were now standing toe to toe, despite him being 20 years younger and a few inches taller than myself. I wasn't going to back down. Start talking, boy. I demanded. Don't buy me, old man. He replied before demanding. Why is every square inch of this place booby-trapped? That caught me off guard. Huh? Was all that I got out. He pointed to the truck. Spikes, driven into the ground. He pointed from where he just came. Fucking razor wire snares in the woods. And I froze. Well, I didn't do any of that. Nor was it like that when I left yesterday. The man pondered that for a minute. Well, perhaps we got off on the wrong foot, he suggested. Well, I think you need to tell me who you are and what you're doing here. And he nodded. Eh, you might be right. I think we should have this conversation somewhere warmer and be on the lookout for whatever else might be laying about. We walked cautiously to the cabin. Sighing in relief, I went to open the door. And just as the door cracked open, the man grabbed my collar and yanked me onto my ass. I spun around, ready to throw hands, but he simply held up a finger. Using the toe of his boot, he gave the door a shove. When it swung open, and with a thwang, an arrow flew out. It had flown low, and if I had been standing there, then it would have caught me in the nuts or lower stomach. I shivered at the thought. The man shook his head. Little bastard's a pissy. The kid got away. I didn't bother asking him what he meant. We entered the cabin slowly, checking everything carefully before deciding that it was safe. I sat on my lazy boy as he took a seat on my couch across from me. Well, now that we're comfortable, I asked. So, start at the beginning. What's your deal? And he paused, and then after some thought, replied. Well, it's a long story, so I'll give it a condensed version. I work for a group that deals with dangerous anomalies. When there's an unexpected or unexplainable spike in deaths or disappearances, one of us gets sent out to investigate. Drowning deaths jump 300% in this area alone. Now this place has always been a hotspot for activity, just not drowning. There is some powerful ass being out here that my employers have been unable to deal with. But this, well, that's different. Well, I just nodded as he kept going. If you've been living out here and you no doubt know what I'm talking about and have found a way to survive with it. So, I get here and I hear there's a missing person in the area. But I decided to help out. And after that, I started tracking the little fiends. And I got as far as this place last night before losing them. I sat up straighter. You mean they're here? I asked. Judging by the traps, I would say yes. What we have here is not something you want to mess with. He replied. I chuckled at that. <laughs> I'm afraid they're already after me, and likely after you as well. Do you know what's causing this? He asked. Well, I have a good hunch. Are you familiar with the Managishi? He nodded. Yeah, the water people. Often related to the Cree nation. Tricksters that enjoy pranks. Well, I don't know all the details, just that a handful ended up down here and they want to kill anyone who helps the local tribe or anyone in connection with those who help. The stranger shook his head in denial. No, no. The Managishi are very peaceful people. They're like children almost, both in size and personality. I've dealt with them before. And I put my hands up. I don't know all the details. Just that one was murdered a long time ago and the others have been seeking revenge ever since. He pondered this. I guess it could be possible. They have the ability to cause real trouble. He walked to the door. I need to contact the office and run this info by them. They might have an idea as to what's going on. Stepping outside, he dialed a number on his phone. He closed the door before I could hear anything. And I took the opportunity to carefully go through my house. I checked every cupboard and every crack for any unpleasant surprises. The place looked to be untouched. It was then that a thought occurred to me. Laura was at the Stump Ranch, and there was a decent chance that Managishi would target her as well. I decided to give her a call, and she picked up on the third ring. Hello, Scott. How's it going? She asked. 
Relief swept over me. Uh, hi, I'm back at my place. Uh, listen, there's something after the Stump family, and it might be after you as well. The line was quiet. Laura finally replied. I got a short explanation on the way to town. Bruce convinced me to stay away for a little while. I'm at my place, packing up some things, and then I head over to my brother's place in Salt Lake City. Well, that's probably a good idea. I see what can be done around here. I told her. Now just be careful. I'd hate for you to join Mark in the hospital. <laughs> I laughed and told her that I would. We said our goodbyes, and I hung up. I saw the stranger was in the doorway, watching me. Cute, he said. But you're better off leaving as well. I can handle the situation. <laughs> the arrogance of this guy was really getting on my nerves. Listen, asshole. My friends are the ones in trouble. I don't care what kind of cloak and dagger organization you're a part of. I'll be right here until it's over. He tried to speak, but I cut him off. And furthermore, if I could survive not only a mystical ancient native warrior, but also go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a five dogmen, I think I can handle some angry waterbound midgets. Well, the man began laughing, and he doubled over, gasping for air. Ha ha ha! Dude! He managed to wheeze out. I'm totally calling them water midgets from here on out. He wiped a tear from his eye. Well, I have it your way. If what you said is true, then you probably have a decent chance of survival. Well, can I get a name then? I asked him, and he thought about it. You can call me Mick. Well, that was good enough for me. Well, I'm Scott, and I guess this is our base of operations. I told him. Not trusting my skill, Mick searched the house himself for traps. Finding nothing, he filled me in on what his boss had told him. Managishi, wild tricky, sometimes malevolently, so typically, weren't deadly unless crossed while near their home. They mostly resided in the northern states and Canada, living in caves or tunnels near or under rapids. They cannot breathe underwater but can hold their breath for nearly an hour, and they have a strength ratio of three, meaning that they are three times as strong as a human of equal size would be. They have incredibly sharp teeth, used to sever fish heads, but are rarely used in defense. The Managishi prefer stealth and trickery over head-on conflict. This was the first report of a group following the exact revenge. This was also the first time they had been reported in a desert climate, as their skin was very susceptible to the sun. The orders were to eradicate the population, as they were both acting rogue and not native to the area. Mick would receive a bonus if he could capture a live specimen for further study. A supply crate would be dropped at noon in two days. Well, it took a moment to absorb all of the information. Well, I guess we guess we better hop to it, I suggested. Mick clapped me on the back. That's the spirit. We'll be knocking back drinks in a local pub in no time. Marco Polo, part four. Let's get straight into that. Scott here. Well, it's been four days since Mark was admitted into hospital. He has yet to wake up, but physically, he's healing well. Susan is staying with him in the hospital, while Matt is taking care of the farm. Matt's friend Yellowknife is also staying at the farm. And so far, the Managishi have resorted to annoying trickery again. Nothing harmful as of yet. Mick and I have been doing our best to track them and learn what we can. Bruce has had some small issues in town. Stolen car keys, shaved pets, overflowing sinks and other such things. Again, no one is really getting harmed, but Mick insists on following through with the eradication orders. Matt is in agreement with him. He has not forgiven them for what they did to Mark. I'm worried Matt's drive for revenge might be his undoing. Mick and I are heading that way this afternoon to discuss our next move. Sitting in the passenger seat of Mick's Dodge 2500, I went over the pictures of our trail camps and what they picked up. Well, there was no perfectly clear images of the little bastards, just lots of blurs. They had a pale blue, almost grey skin tone. And they wore clothes of bark and deer skin. The height ranged from two feet to just shy of four feet. And that was pretty much just guesswork, but we estimated there was around seven of them. The best picture we had was one Bruce had gotten on his camera 
in the storm drain systems in town. White showed a three foot four little blue gray man, lacking a nose with eyes as black as obsidian. It had a few strands of black stringy hair plastered to its skull, and almost reminded me of a well muscled golem from the Lord of the Rings movies. Now the truck bumping down the stump's driveway broke my train of thought. I placed the pictures back into the folder as Mark engaged a parking brake. He put the truck in neutral with a wiggle of the shifter. The Mick was energetic, immature and cocky, but the guy knew how to track down Curtis. Now he was a lot more organised than I would have expected, and was extremely cautious about certain moves. I opened in the door, I jumped from the obnoxiously tall truck. How do you ever sneak up on anything in this noisy pile? I asked him, and he chuckled. <laughs> Horsepower ain't quiet. Normally I catch a plane and get a rental. This job just so happened to be within driving distance of where I was staying. I wondered if getting all of his tires punctured made him regret using his personal truck for work. If it did, he didn't let it show. The guy was always chipper. And Mick strode right through the front door. Knock, knock, bitches, he called out. Anybody home? Living room, Matt replied. Yellow knife for Matt was sitting on the couch. In the centre of the room was a white folding table, stacked deep in papers. I threw my fire onto the table as well. Anything useful? I asked. Yellow knife pulled up a large map. It was covered in tiny red X's and blue lines. Every X is a sighting and the lines represent waterways. You notice they like to stay close to the water, even if it's just a small crick. Mick pulled the bio he'd received from his boss out of the folder. It would appear that they're stronger near running water. Plus, with their strength, they could likely drown just about anyone. I pulled a chair up to the table. I studiously went over the trail camp pictures and sighted maps. Matt looked to Mick. So, what's the plan for getting rid of these things? Mick ran his fingers through his curly hair. It might be nuts, but I think we can lay some lethal traps. Once we kill a few, the others will come after us with a vengeance. We sat there, looking at each other. It was Yellowknife that broke the silence. I'm not saying it won't work. He paused. But if these things took out a full force of brutal native warriors, how much of a chance did we stand? Mick stroked the sparse blonde stubble on his chin. We got better weapons, that's for sure. I'm pretty sure those guys didn't know what they were dealing with, either. What about the townsfolk? I asked. They could end up on the receiving end of things, and Mick had an answer for this as well. We have to hit hard and fast, get him riled up and then wipe them out. I didn't share his level of optimism. In fact, I was downright doubtful of his plan. Matt spoke next. What if we lured him a decent ways away, or somewhere with little to no water, and we can have an ambush set up? Well, I like that idea. Well, it needs to be fleshed out into a plan, I answered. A yellow knife pointed to a very familiar spot on the map, right here. Well, it's all desert for miles plus. It's an easily defendable location. He was pointing to Redskin Butte, the mesa between the place and the stump ranch, the former hunting grounds of the native warrior turned skinwalker. Well, he was correct in assuming it would be perfect for an ambush. I wasn't a fan of this place, but it was set up like a medieval castle. Mick, I can set things up out there, since we're closer. I volunteered. Yellowknife nodded. Matt and myself can load down from the city sewers. I thought that once we heard them, any others hanging about this area would join the chase. Well, the room had a sombre feeling about it. Each of us knew the risks, but we were okay with them. We spent the next hour finalising plans and then split ways for the day. We hoped to have everything ready in two days. Come Saturday morning, we would eliminate the little pests that had terrorised this area for so long. What's for lunch? Mick asked as we pulled up to my cabin. I hopped from his truck to the ground below. We got chips and carne asada left. Once that's gone, we have to make a trip to town. If you want to heat that up, I'll pack some bags for the scouting mission out to the butte. Mick suggested. Well, I was in agreement, and while Mick rummaged around one of the boxes he'd received as part of a supply drop, I placed the strips of meat into the microwave. Two minutes later, the day-old left her. 
Two minutes later, the day-old leftovers were ready. I joined him in the living room. Mick had traps, climbing harnesses, and electronics strewn about the entire room, covering every piece of furniture. Uh, you're like a toddler in a toy store, I said as I handed him a share of the lunch. And Mick chuckled. Ha <laughs> ha, you can never have too many toys. A lot of what Mick had set out was more sophisticated than expected. He had multiple motion sensors and even a drone equipped with a very nice camera. What's the plan? I asked. Mick motioned to a pile on the couch. All of that gets packed up there today. We set some things up and decide what else we need once we get a lay of the land. Well, that sounds good to me. I replied and then began packing things into one of the backpacks. The first bag contained the drone, three motion sensors, and multiple rolls of Type 4 paracord. The second bag had climbing harnesses and all the necessary accessories. I loaded the bags into the bed of Mick's truck while he studied multiple maps of the Redskin Butte area, ranging from topographical to weather. And as soon as I had everything in the truck, Mick folded up the maps and we headed out. And a recent snow had turned the road into a sticky mess. Mick struggled to keep the truck on the clay track. The tires threw mud into the sky as the truck clawed its way up the trail. And finally, we reached the trailhead that would lead us to the butte. Mick slammed his door and then looked at the globs of clay sliding down the side of his truck. He grunted in disgust. Ah, that's never going to buff out, he commented. Well, white tires will do that, I told him. He flipped me off. Ah, screw the paint. The tires look damn good. I just shook my head and pulled the now mud-covered backpack from the bed. If I'd known you were going to be gone bogging, I would have crammed these into the cab. Mick wiped some of the large chunks from his back before replying. Ah, to help us blend in, he joked. I hefted the back up onto my shoulders. Well, it's this way, about an hour's walk this time of year. I led the way with Mick close behind. The path was difficult to follow with all the fresh snow. More than once I had to stop and double check the GPS. At least we couldn't get lost. Not with Redskin Butte jutting out into the sky. Well, at some point we had completely lost the trail and just started trudging into the direction of the butte. Upon arriving at our destination, we both took a moment to admire the monolithic tower before us. The flat landscape surrounding it gave the butte an even more grandeur presence. Mick clapped his hands loudly. Well, there's nothing to it except to get through it, he said joyfully. We unpacked the bag of climbing gear and strapped it onto ourselves. Mick led the way up the rock face. He climbed through the rough surface like someone would a jungle gym. He was kind enough to set anchors for me on his way up. It took us a lot less time than I had expected to scale the 70 foot cliff. The top was mostly smooth, with some patches of grass here and there, and a very shallow pond near the centre. Now Mick walked over to a circle of logs surrounding the charred remains of a fire. Well, I never would have guessed that people came up here, he said. Well, there's a group that does, and they aren't really normal, though. I told him, unsure of how much he would believe me if I tried to explain the local ghoul population. What, like natives still living their old ways? He asked to inspect the long dead remains. Uh, native to the area, <laughs> I guess. Folks around here, leave them alone. We shouldn't run into any of us. Only come up here once every couple of months. I explained. The mix stood up. Well, we're best scared to work. I don't want to get caught out here in the dark. The mix anchored a rope ladder that would make climbing up and down much easier while I installed motion sensors around the perimeter. If tripped, the sensors would emit a loud alarm of flashing red lights. Mick used a pair of binoculars to scan the surrounding area and then marked on a map where he thought assailants might be able to hide. And feeling like we had a good plan of attack, we made our way back to the truck. Well, I'm starving. How does Jack's dinner sound? I asked. Mick shrugged. Well, at this point, anything sounds good to me. Well, we got back into the muddy Dodge pickup and headed for town. I texted Matt with our dinner plans, and he said that they would just meet us there. Within the hour, we pulled up to the best diner in town. Matt's jeep was already parked out front. Luckily for us, he and Yellowknife had grabbed the table as the place was packed. Well, how'd your day go? I asked as Mick and I grabbed the seat. Matt and Yellowknife looked at each other. Uh, things were going fine. 
We scattered out multiple ways into the sewer system, but, but then we ran into some trouble. Bruce caught us down there and wanted to know what was going on. And well, he doesn't like the plan, Matt said hesitantly. What doesn't he like about it? Mick asked indignantly. Yellowknife pointed behind us. Well, why don't you ask him yourself? Bruce spotted us and made his way across the room. He pulled up a chair and sat down with us. Well, what have you gotten yourself into this time? The question was directed at me. I couldn't blame him for assuming that it was my fault. Trouble had a way of finding me. Before I could reply, Mick answered. We're just dealing with some non-native pests. It'll all be taken care of by this weekend. And Bruce gave him a cold stare. Don't jerk my chain, boy. I was sending nightmares back to hell while you were still sucking your mama's tip. That line of bullshit don't fly around here. Mick had the common sense to keep his mouth shut. Bruce continued. Tomorrow night, we're going to have a town meeting. That's how we decide things around here. If your plan is approved, well, you can enact it Saturday. Don't be dumb and try anything before then. And with that, Bruce left us to try and enjoy our meal. I felt like a scolded child when that was the first time I had seen Bruce lay down the law. I now knew why no one gave him any shit. The old man was still a hard ass. I was first to break the awkward silence. Yeah, that's pretty much what he told us earlier. Oh, well, I said, we better have a convincing argument come tomorrow. But Mick just shook his head. He has no authority over me. Regardless of the decision, I'm going through with the plan. But I understand if none of you want to. You all live here after all. And I spoke up again. Well, I'll be with you. These things have to go. They have to pay for what they've done to my family. Yellowknife and I shared an uncertain look. Oh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Oh, there's no need to get worked up over something that might not happen. I suggested. Yellowknife agreed. Yes, and perhaps the others could offer insight or even assistance. In fact, I believe I'll contact the tribe as well. Madam Mick seemed to relax a little. We took the time to order our food and enjoy the evening, swapping stories. Mick had travelled to eleven countries and confirmed Bigfoot was indeed real. We shocked Yellowknife with Matt and mine's dogman encounter. The whole group burst out in loud laughter when I described how I wounded the one that had pinned Matt down. Before we knew it, the dinner rush had passed and we were the last ones there. Jack himself left the kitchen and talked with us for a bit before kicking us out for the night. And saying our goodbyes, we went our separate ways. Mick and I had to my place, and Matt drove himself and Yellowknife back to the farm. When we got home, I kicked off my boots and fell into bed, and I was asleep instantly. But a bright morning light woke me up. My mouth felt dirty, as did the sweaty clothes that I had slept in. And slightly disgusted with myself, I went to the bathroom and took a shower. And after brushing my teeth and a quick shave, I felt much better. Well, something felt off. The cabin. Oh, I was quiet. Oh, where is Mick? I thought to myself. And a quick glance into the living room showed the couch he had been sleeping on the past couple of nights was empty. I looked outside and saw his truck was missing as well. And starting to feel concerned, I dug my cell phone from my pocket. I dialed his number and hit call. It rang for a while and then went to voicemail. Next, I called Matt. His phone didn't ring at all, but went straight to voicemail. Seriously concerned, now I tried Yellowknife's number. He picked up on a third ring. What? He asked. When it was clear, I had woken him up. Is Matt there? I demanded. The line was silent for a couple of minutes. Yellowknife came back to say, uh, Yeah, he's snoring away. What's up? I sighed with relief. Mick isn't here, and Matt didn't answer when I called. I guess I assumed the worst. Yellowknife chuckled. <laughs> I grew up with Matt. Your concerns are not unfounded. Well, I better find out where Mick went. Keep an eye on Matt for me, will you? Well, yeah, will do, Yellowknife replied. I hung up and grabbed my car keys. We had driven Mick's Dodge down the driveway enough times that I was fairly certain the blazer wouldn't make it out. And sure enough, the little crossover climbed this way to freedom. 
I tried Mick's number again, but he still didn't pick up. I reached the end of the driveway. Right as I was about to pull up to the road, I had to slam on the brakes. My heart skipped a beat as Mick's lifted ass track nearly run me over. I jumped out of the car and strode over to him. Where have you been? I demanded. He looked genuinely shot. Then he slowly lifted a bag of takeout from Jack's diner. We forgot to buy food last night, he stated. Embarrassment washed over me. I thought you had gone after the Managishi on your own, I admitted. Now it was his turn to be annoyed. Dude, all I did was grab some breakfast. I turned the car around and we headed back to the cabin. Mick had brought sausage and egg breakfast burritos. And surprisingly, I was starving. Then I saw it was one in the afternoon. Where did a day go? I asked incredulously. But a mouth stuffed full of burrito. Mick shrugged his shoulders and mumbled. We, uh, we didn't get back until after 2 a.m. I texted Bruce asking when the meeting would be and he replied with a simple 4.30 at the library. Make sure you're there. With time to kill, I called Laura. We talked well into the afternoon, and she told me how hard it was to sleep at night with her twin newborn nieces being one room over. But her brother and his wife were very grateful for their help. I gave her a vague idea of what our plan was and assured her everything would blow over by Monday. Are you sure Laura and empty yourselves is a good idea? She asked, her voice laden with worry. And I told her it was. Oh, don't worry. We'll take every precaution. Bruce has his eye on us. I added with a chuckle. Before I knew it, Mick popped into my room to inform me that it was time to head out. Well, I better get going. I can't be late for our own meeting. I said, and Laura replied. Be careful. I love you, Scott. I love you too, sweetheart. I'll be seeing you soon. Early that evening, we rolled up to the library. I led the way through the double steel doors, and they opened into a large space filled with chairs. At the far end was two white tables, and behind them sat the city council, as well as Bruce and two elders from the nearby tribe and reservation. Now Bruce motioned for us to take a seat in the four chairs in front of him. Matt and Yellowknife joined us right as we each took a seat. A few more people then filtered into the room, but the room remained much emptier than it usually was during meetings. Mayor Grayson, a poorly bolded man, with a mean disposition, started a meeting with a slam of his gavel. Listen up, he bellowed. This meeting has been called to discuss how probably to move forward in dealing with certain pests. And Bruce stood. You all know Scott, Mad and Yellowknife. The fourth guy goes by Mick and works for one of those men in the Black Star organizations. But the crowd murmured disapprovingly at this revelation. Are we going to have to deal with this one the same way as the last? Asked a voice in the back. Bruce shot the man with an annoyed look. Did you just, seriously, just ask that? And the man shrugged. Well, if he works for them, and I'm sure he knows what happened last time. Looking at a confused mech, I figured I wasn't alone in not knowing what happened. That's neither here nor there. This is about dealing with the Managishi that have been plaguing this area for generations stated Bruce, and with that, he signalled Mick to proceed. For the first time since I'd met him, he looked nervous. Ah, uh, well, you know my name. He started awkwardly. Uh, like the sheriff said, I'm here to deal with your evil water midget problem. Someone called in for assistance in investigating the uptick in tourist deaths in the area, and don't bother asking who, as that's way above my pay grade. They point, I fix. We know these things are capable of killing people. Our plan is to have half our team lure them out to the sewers where they appear to be living, and the other half will ambush them once they reach Redskin Butte. Mick sat down with a sigh of relief. The crowd as well as the council talks amongst themselves, and Bruce stood once again. Ah, uh, does, does anyone have any concerns or questions? The elderly lady stood up and asked, Why must you disturb them? They seem mostly harmless to us town folk. We've allowed much more dangerous creatures to roam free. Bruce turned to us. Mac gave a quick retort. Uh, you tell that to Mark as he's clinging to life in a hospital. Hearing the cold still in his voice, the lady sat down in 
Ben's sons. A man in a suit around my age then stood up. Uh, my condolences to your brother Matt, but my concern is what happens to us living in town after you get these things all riled up? Why is stopping them from going after easy targets they can find? I make took this question. Well, our research shows that they go after very specific targets. They traveled all this way from Canada to avenge a single death. And not everyone knew the origin story, so one of the elders present gave a short version of it. So, we traded one devil that stayed in the desert for a pack of them to live under our streets? Came an angry shout from the back. More voices began to rise up, some in favour, others against. And Bruce took the gavel from Grayson and beat the table with it. The racket brought some order back to the room. Enough of that! ordered Bruce before handing the mayor his gavel back. I think we've all heard enough. Let's put it to a vote. Those in favour rise. Those opposed remain seated. The council abstained from the vote. Bruce counted 13 in favour and 15 opposed. And Bruce turned to us. I'm sorry, boys, but the vote speaks. He was cut off by the slamming of the double steel doors. A pale... Tired-looking Susan entered the room, and she looked blankly around before her gaze fell on Matt. And he stood. Mum? He said questioningly. But Susan didn't speak. Her eyes dropped to the ground. And then Matt began to shake his head violently. No. No, no. He whispered quietly. And then in a fit of rage, he kicked a chair across the room, causing meeting attendees to duck. And Matt cried out in anguish, dropping to his knees and he sobbed openly. Susan rushed to put her arms around him. He fought hard, Maddie, but it was just too much damage done. And the room was silent. The son and mother held each other. I felt tears pricking at my eyes. Mark had been such a lively source of happiness. The kid didn't deserve this. The family didn't deserve this. And a familiar voice spoke up. Hey, Bruce... I would like to change my vote. It was a local beef rancher named Tom. He continued. When Scott first came here, well, I was pissed, thinking he would stir up the devil of Redskin Butte. I didn't want to admit to myself that the devil could be defeated. Well, that would mean I could have avenged my baby girl Daisy years ago. Instead, well, I stood by while Luke, Randy, and so many others were taken. But I was wrong. I want to make up for it. Now I'm going to help these boys and send those bastards back to hell. Now all of us need to stand up and take some goddamn responsibility. And two other men stood. And one of the men spoke up with a thick Slavic accent. Count us in, Tom. I am sick of being scared my kid won't come home someday. I am sick of avoiding families of tourists as they search for missing loved ones. And Tom and the two men approached Susan. They offered their condolences. Bruce ran his fingers through what was left of his hair. Well, typically, votes are final, but I'm to hell with it. This bullshit has got to end before we lose anyone else. And Bruce turned to the group. Unless anybody objects, no one did. The room changed from that of a town meeting to a war room instantly. Our city is small. Barely even recognized by the state, started Bruce. The storm drains only dump out in two places, both within 20 yards of each other. The other exits are the treatment yard and five manholes. A Tom returned from the back of the library with a utilities map. Unrolling it on the table, it clearly showed each drain line and all the catch basins. The men who supported Tom introduced themselves as Bryce and Lars, cousins from Czechoslovakia. They volunteered to cover the treatment centre. Both were familiar with it and claimed it could be locked down by closing a single gate. Tom would accompany Matt and Yellowknife into the underground system. Mick and I would be waiting at the top of the butte. But Lars asked a question with his thick accent. Why go so far? Can we not eliminate them here and now? I don't understand the need to lure them all the way to the desert. Mick answered him. Mostly to limit collateral damage. Secondly, they draw power from water, so going head-to-head -head with them in a the dark underground are 
That's a bad idea. Lars nodded thoughtfully. I see. I hope your plan works. Well, I think we all hope for that. Plan in order. We set out a Polaris Razor on tracks just outside the sewer exit. Cars were parked on each manhole cover, and the cousins locked down the plant. Come daybreak, Matt, Tom, and Yellowknife would head underground. Bruce would watch the streets for any trouble, and the cousins would monitor the treatment plant. Well, nothing to it but to do it, Mick said cheerfully. He whistled a light-hearted tune as he strode out the door, like this was a daily recurrence. Susan hugged Matt tight. You come back to me, you hear? You're all I got left. And Matt bent over and buried his face in her shoulder. Ah, of course, I'll come back. Don't you worry. And Susan released him. No matter how much taller than me my baby gets, I will always worry. And Matt just smiled down at her. I love you, Ma. I'll see you once this is over. And Lars and Bryce went to their respective homes, as did Bruce, leaving just myself, Yellowknife, and the stumps. And before we could leave, the steel door flung open, slamming into the wall with a deafening clang. We all jumped in surprise at the noise. A very angry Sarah stormed into the room. When did you plan on telling your girlfriend about this idiotic plan? She asked Matt. And he stammered something that I couldn't catch. Sarah got into his face as much as her short stature allowed. Well, she demanded, you've been ghosting my calls and texts all week. And now find out from the kid that I'm babysitting, that you plan on searching for these things in the sewer? She screamed in frustration and stomped her foot. I don't have a choice, Matt managed to say. She spun on him with fury in her eyes. I told you we needed to move away. I told you when the devil almost killed you. I told you again when fucking werewolves almost got us both. This is your last chance, Matt. I'm leaving here tonight before things go bad. I expect you to come with. Matt looked her dead in the eye and simply said, No. Sarah looked like she was about to explode. No? You can't say no. We've been together nine years. I'm your everything. Her voice was cracking as she said the last part. Matt reached for her. I'm sorry, but this is something that I need to do. She swatted his hands away. Don't you? I'm sorry, me. And Sarah brought her hand back to slap him, but Susan caught her wrist. Now, sweetie, we both know Matt would never hit a girl. He was raised better than that. But if you try and hurt my boy, I'll bury your body so deep in the desert, he won't find you for a thousand years. And Susan's icy tone left no doubt as the validity of her threat. Sarah yanked her, wrist free, and she slowly backed towards the door. She shot Matt one last vengeful glare before disappearing into the night. Well, wasn't that just the icing on a wonderful night? Matt remarked bitterly. Susan placed a hand on his shoulder. I'm sorry, it ended like that. And Matt gave his mother a peck on the forehead and replied, I think I'll go home and get some sleep before tomorrow. I offered Susan a ride home, but she politely declined. I'm not ready to go back just yet. I'm going to stay with some friends here in town. But thank you for the offer. I gave her a hug before turning to leave myself. And just before I left the building, Susan called out. Hey, Scott? Yeah, I replied. You bring my baby boy back to me. And not knowing what to say, I simply nodded and exited the building. So, uh, Kind of got left behind by everyone. Uh, any chance I can catch a ride at Matt's place? And sure enough, Mick's Dodge was the only vehicle left in the parking lot. Sure, hop in. I'll let Mick know. After dropping Yellowknife off, we headed for the cabin. In the living room was a second black crate made of steel that Mick received shortly after his arrival. Well, the contents were a mystery to me as he had not yet opened it. And I pointed it out. Are you finally going to let me see what's so important about that box? And Mick grinned. I figure it's about time. He knelt down in front of it. He then punched a nine-digit code into the integrated keypad. And as he unlocked it, he explained. I recently spent some time with another contractor who taught me a lot. My employers will hold these crates 
fill with our choice of items for us, and then send them to us if we need it. Why, well, it's super handy. And the lid opened with a quiet pop. Mick withdrew a soft body vest, and putting it on, he removed the short katana next. It slid into a scabbard on his back. A sword? I questioned. Well, I thought the same thing until I learned how to use one. Melee weapons have their place. And he removed the divider and revealed an assortment of firearms underneath. Mick joyfully set a revolver on the table. Next, he laid a compact rifle, followed by a particularly disassembled semi-automatic rifle. Nothing beats shooting a far 60 Smith and Wesson Magnum for the first time, said Mick as he loaded the six massive brass rounds into the revolver. That there, that's a Scorpion Evo, A1. When she gets close, it pays to be able to lay down a wall of lead. And finally, I got old reliable, the 338 Lapool Magnum. I smoked plenty of targets with that old girl, he chuckled. What, no Barrett? Not today, he replied. He looked quite proud of his collection. I almost felt bad when I walked over to an unassuming closet door. Behind the wood door was a steel safe door. I punched in the combination and then spun the handle. And pulling the safe open, I revealed a decent sized room. The walls, floor and ceiling were smooth concrete. Along one wall was a wood bench with ammo crates stacked underneath. The two other walls were lined with firearms of various sorts from floor to ceiling. I've had this safe room built for a few years back. Ever since I've been slowly filling it for occasions like this. I explained. Mick gazed at the collection with an unashamed reverence. Dude, this must have cost a fortune. I mean, that's a real dragon off SVD. Where did you find some of these? He asked in awe. Well, I started with a few rifles from the local gun shop. Once I got hooked on the more rare and unique guns, the owner started keeping an eye out for me. I'm working towards getting my license so I can own four auto in the near future. And Mick obviously approved. I could see he shared my taste as he closely inspected some of the more rare collectibles. The back wall housed what I considered to be the down-to-business tools. I took down my trusty Sage 12-gauge, a lightweight Browning 300 Win Mag lever action, as well as my Hellcat 9mm. And I added a final piece, an MTS 255 revolving 12-gauge shotgun that I had cut the barrel down to 8 inches and replaced the buttstock with a pistol grip. Firing normal shells through it, <laughs> I would snap your wrist, but with a foregrip mounted under the barrel, it was perfect for Dragon's Breath incendiary rounds. Taking the bag from the wall, I slid extra magazines into the custom pockets, along with an extensive first aid kit and combat knife. Mick and I set our bags next to the front door. We would grab food and water from the fridge in the morning. And fully packed, we settled down for the night. Come morning, we would set our plan into action. And I prayed that we would see nightfall. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. Once again, Hobo Sam, absolutely riveting story. I love how this one seamlessly is coming together and building to a big finale. A humongous thank you for your patience and incredible input on this channel. We really do appreciate it. And I'm sure the listeners enjoy your work as much as I. Of course, I hope you enjoyed this rendition and I look forward to the big finale. Well... Guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. Why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you think you got the minerals or want to have a crack of things like myself, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com I really look forward to hearing from you I hope you all had a fantastic weekend whether at home or work with friends or family and I hope you're fighting fit 
and taking a fight back to life. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry. I hope everyone's having a fantastic little, little, little. It's the little things. Last page. Susan placed a hand on his shoulder. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It ended like that. And Matt gave his mother a peck on the forehead and replied. <sighs> Embarrassment washed over me. <laughs> Embarrassment washed over me. Embarrassment washed over me. I thought you'd gone on... Fuck you now. I thought you'd gone after the Managishi. On your own. I admit it. Just... Now Mick strode right through the front door. Knock knock, bitches. He called out. Not trusting my skill, Mick searched the house himself for traps. Finding nothing, he filled me in on what his boss had told him. Managishi. Wow, Tricky. Stop!